life in order. So financial goals, um, relationship goals, um, education goals, career goals. So just this push to get things in order before the age of 30. And so um, when a client presents to me with relationship concerns, at that point, there's usually multiple tumultuous relationships within that client's life. So there's this common repeating theme that I've noticed throughout, the, throughout those relationships. And that could be intimate partner relationships, it could be work relationships, or even family. Um, so foundationally, I would identify myself as a cognitive behavior therapist. So I would see, I would use the cognitive model with the clients uh, to try to help them to realize or understand their maladaptive behaviors or ways of thinking in regards to relationships. And I remember feeling that that, it, that was not enough, um, that I wanted to provide my client with more, and I felt like they needed more. And so even though I do integrate other theories within practice, it seemed like that still wasn't enough. And we all know that most theories uh, that we practice in the counseling world don't necessarily have that multicultural component. And so African Americans in terms, um, in general terms are classified as collectivist, uh, collectivist groups of people. And so that means um, we are interdependent inter within our group. Um, so within the groups, and I identify as African-American woman, uh, so within the groups, we may see women seeking advice from their grandmother, their mother, or their aunt regarding their relationships. And um, depending upon what the direction is that, that those um, um, women within our family provide, we typically would take that advice because they know what's best. And so when we talk about boundaries and setting limits with families, that might not necessarily work for a group of collectivist people. Um, and so with that, I can't recall exactly how it was introduced to RCT, which is relational cultural theory. Uh, but once I read connection and relationship, it pulled me in to want to learn more about the theory. And so this semester in my advanced theories course, we actually go in deeper and understand um, the, the concept of relational cultural theory. And so the name of, of my workshop today is Creating Connection in a Therapeutic Relationship. And so there are a few learning objectives that we will focus on. So the first is we're, of course, going to define what a therapeutic relationship is. Uh, I'm going to summarize some of the basic tenets of, well, actually, I'm just going to give a brief history on uh, RCT and how it came to be. And then also going into some foundational aspects of RCT within the client and um, clinician relationship or alliance. We're going to also identify some connections and disconnections within those therapeutic relationships and then understand how to change those disconnections to connections, which is called um, res relational resilience. So, so I'm going to start off with this statement. So this is a statement uh, by the APA Society of Clinical Psychology Task Force. They note that therapy relationships make substantial and consistent contributions to psychotherapy outcome independent of the type of treatment and that therapy relationship accounts for why clients improve or fail to improve at least as much as the particular treatment method. So research has shown that the therapeutic relationship is essential to client success. Um, and before I go on, let's go to the next slide. So um, this task force it, it has actually gone through um, several different phases. So their goal was to identify and operationalize and disseminate information about the therapeutic relationship. And so they also uh, investigated the power of therapeutic relationship in relation to empirically supported treatment. And so they adopted this operational um, definition by Gelso and Carter, uh, 1985 to 1994, um, which says the relationship is the feelings and the attitudes that therapists and clients 
have towards one another and the manner in which these are expressed. So this is a broad definition, but it gives a lot of room to um, interpret exactly what that means. Um, how, how do we understand the expression of one another's um, reactions or thoughts, feelings or attitudes within those sessions? Uh, within these definitions, there's also, um, actually there's another um, statement that I have here um, by Dr. Uh, John Norcross, Norcross, and he's actually the, um, the lead on these task, um, task force. So within his definition and then the previous definition, um, we see the characteristics of mutuality uh, and working together collaboratively for a common goal. Um, we see the openness and the commitment to share so those characteristics that we see are those res the respect, the commitment, the mutuality, the empathy, the caring, the concern. Um, and so within the relationship, we're modeling to our clients how to be in, in relationship by discussing their emotions, by being vulnerable, by building trust, by being authentic. Um, and for that, the, the therapeutic relationship is powerful. Um, there's another uh, kind of classification um, uh, based on some research. There's two different types of alliances. So um, Laborski, 1976, pretty, um, pretty old, but I think still relevant, um, says there's two different types of therapeutic relationships. In the earlier part of the client counselor relationship, we have the client's perspective of the therapist being a support system for the client, uh, which happens early on. And then for the second type, which is um, seen once that relationship progresses, is a collaborative relationship. So when I conceptualize this in my head, I visualize to myself as when the client comes into the counseling space, when they make a decision to come in, um, it's kind of like they're looking for the counselor to guide them and to let them know exactly what their thoughts are, how they can help. So there's um, this dependence, in a sense, on uh, the counselor to lead them. But then as the relationship progresses, it's more of a collaborative thing. So now I can talk to the client or the counselor about the goals that I wish to accomplish. And within that relationship, we're working together to determine what is best for me. Um, so they have a sense of a power empowerment as that relationship grows and learning how to work together and to be into relationship. So like I said before, the therapeutic relationship is power powerful. It has the ability to influence the relationship in the way that the client has with others. It helps them to develop the intrapersonal, intrapersonal, and communication skills. Um, so there's a personal bond um, within that therapeutic relationship that is significantly impactful for the client's life. So now we go into um, the introduction of relational cultural theory. And so this um, quote I actually saw, I was going through my social media page and there was another therapist that posted this article and it captured my attention pretty quick off. Um, at this point, we were getting into RCT connection, disconnection within our class discussions and so this caught my eye. I was thinking, oh yeah, this is a RCT article. It was not, but some of the same um, components, similar components were mentioned within this article. So it says that connection is a core need, um, but of course us humans are terrible at it. So um, actually, let me see if I can move this down a little bit. So no person is an island and we need healthy connection to thrive. And so that sets the stage for what to expect with relational cultural theory. So relational cultural theory uh, was initially a feminist approach and it was conceived by Dr. Jean Baker Miller. And so with this, we understand that 
with um, white feminism and black feminism is two different things. And so with that, women of color advocated their perspective and for their perspective to be heard within that. And the awesome thing is Dr. Uh, Baker Miller actually listened to that perspective and explored it in a book called uh, Towards a New Psychology for Women. And within that, um, she acknowledged that the, the exclusion of these groups and the theory was reframed into a more multicultural and social justice uh, components were incorporated into it. A few, a few years later, um, Dr. Baker Miller started to work with other uh, three other psychologists and they created this collective that was known as the Stone Center Theory or Self in Relation Theory. And so we're looking at is um, just kind of how this relational cultural theory transform into what we use today. So these are some core concepts and I'll go into more detail in just a moment about um, what these different components are. So it says that human connection is necessary throughout the lifespan. So not just early on, not when we're um, teenagers going to school, it's actually a lifelong process that we need. Movement towards mutuality uh, connotes um, mature, uh, mature functioning. Relationship differentiation and elaboration characterizes growth. Mutual empathy and mutual empowerment are necessary for growth fostering relationship. Authenticity is necessary. All people contribute and grow or benefit. There's also uh, relationship compliance and then mutual empathy being um, a primary means to growth. And so let's look at um, some of the components within these. So we have authenticity. Uh, authenticity deals with being honest with regards to the feelings of the client. So it's necessary to display this within our relationships or general interactions with somebody. So we see this, um, this is also like a basis of some other theory that we practice Carl Rogers and that unconditional positive regard and being authentic and being genuine within that relationship. So that's basically what um, this theory also incorporates is that authentic relationship. Uh, it's the ability to be empathetic, empathetic, caring, and having a general interest in what is happening with one another. Authenticity can produce positive relational outcomes. And so that also goes into why it's important for that authenticity in that client uh, counselor relationship. Um, because we're complex beings, we're complex uh, people, we're emotional, and we understand that it takes work, but once we invest the work, we can actually get there. So when it comes to um, mutual empathy and growth fostering relationship, mutual empathy is at the center. Uh, so it's, it's not a, um, a one-way concept to where one person within the relationship can give and the other person just takes. It has to come from both um, sides. Um, at least two people working together collaboratively. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to just be one person, but it could be two people working together collaboratively to increase the capacity of relational resilience and mutual empowerment. And we'll talk more about uh, relational resilience when it comes to um, the client and the counsel relationship and identifying disconnections within that relationship. Um, so there is a need for growth in the relationship due to life changes um, evolving of individuals. So in understanding this concept of mutual empathy and growth fostering relationship, there is a possibility for healthy long-term enhanced relationships. Um, through growth fostering relationship between the client and the, and the clinician, together, we seek to reduce and eliminate those protective strategies, which are known as disconnections. And I'll talk about disconnections in just a second. So with this um, 
mutual empathy with the growth fostering relationships, there are five outcomes that were identified. And those growth fostering relationships, those five good things, um, once those relationships are produced, are this greater sense of zest, vit uh, vitality, energy, it's fulfilling, um, the increased knowledge of clarity about oneself, about other people, and about the relationship. Uh, they create this creativity and productivity, a greater sense of worth, and a desire of connection. So it feels free, it feels um, welcoming, invite, inviting, it feels energetic. Uh, so, like I said, one of those key um, aspects is that we need those growth fostering, that we need connection to thrive um, in life. Um, let me actually go back. Okay, so I talked about authenticity, sorry. Okay, so let's look at the disconnection. So like I said, we have connection, which is um, pretty self-exclamatory, being aligned with someone or something. Um, the disconnection, of course, is the opposite of that. So disconnection within a relationship will happen. So we can't deny that, you know, we won't get into a dispute or argument, um, but it becomes an issue when it's a chronic disconnection. And chronic disconnections in relationships occur when you have somebody who has less power, um, uh, less power in that relationship, and it suppresses her voice or his voice also um, to appease the other person. So say for instance, I'm in a relationship, me and my mom, we're pretty cool. Um, and then I have a daughter and my mom tries to tell me exactly how to raise my daughter, the things that I need to do for my daughter as a mom. And with me being collectivist in, in nature, as far as my, my cultural identity, it's kind of hard for me to stand up to my mom, but it causes turmoil within me. I don't feel like I have a voice to say anything to her and let her know that it's my daughter because guess what? My culture is disrespectful and you don't disrespect your mom. You don't question what she tells you to do. Um, and so in that situation, myself, the oppressed person, moves out of that gross fostering relationship to try to conform, um, to be accepted by the more powerful person. And so as a result, there's a loss of self. Um, and this is something that I see quite often with um, the clients that I have when it comes to parenting, when it comes to um, relationships with partners where there's turmoil within that. And yes, I'm trying to assert myself. I'm trying to, to let him or her know exactly what's happening. But guess what? They won't listen. And so I don't know what I should do at that point. And I don't know who I am within that situation because the old me wouldn't let it go. But the new me is saying I'm stuck and I don't know what to do. And so what we seek to do is we try to assist our clients with first identifying those disconnections, but then how can we bring um, these disconnections into more growth uh, producing, growth fostering relationships. And then we have um, we have relational images, and relational images um, are the foundation of how we function in relationships and in life. So it's our understanding and our meaning of relationship. So these images can be formed through life experiences, and they can create both positive and negative expectations of how relationships should be. These images can create an understanding of how one sees themselves and it can determine the, the, the self-worth of an individual. The positive thing, even though sometimes the relational images, um, they imprint in our brains and 
we feel like this is the only thing, or even the client, they feel like this is the only thing um, that they have and they don't know anything differently. The positive thing about negative relationship images is the ability to have those images to be transformed into more positive images that produce personal growth. And then we also have controlling images. So controlling images are those images that dictate who we are and what we do. So it disempowers us. And um, we can use the examples of, you know, when African American women, when they're viewed as angry black women, or uh, they, we can't necessarily say what we want because we're going to be perceived in a different way. Um, and so we censor ourselves because of the controlling image of how I am expected to be, or this was given to me and there was nothing that I did um, to bring any truth to it. So that's an example of a controlling image. So the counselor's role in RCT is to work on connections and disconnections. Um, we are models, like I said earlier, we are models for our clients. Um, so we have to identify, address those things, and then work to um, come into alignment. We have to address the misalignment and the disconnections and in a mutual relationship with that client. So that goes into the development of mutual empathy. So we're working along with the client, um, but also when we're modeling, we're teaching them how to do that. Because sometimes within those relationships, if there has been turmoil throughout the course, then a client might not necessarily know how to demonstrate some of these things. And that goes into the power of our role as therapists and as counselors is because we have um, the ability to model how a relationship should look within that session. So we work through um, restructuring those relational images. So if a client comes in and her challenge was with her aunts and the expectations of her aunt and she sees all women as um, controlling and um, bold and disregards everyone else and that's how she's seen the relationship within the counseling session, we can reconstruct the way that looks. And since I am a woman and her aunt is a woman, then I can model those behaviors um, so that she can come into relationship with other people and she knows how that looks. That goes into the relationship resilience. So building some understanding of what relationships look like. And so, like I said, there will be disconnections in relationships. Um, but we can work on not classifying all relationships in that way and also identifying how we can change that relationship to get a different outcome to, to bring it back into alignment with a growth fostering relationship. And then we have um, the validation and the acknowledgement of cultural and social context. So that is something that is the therapist is the therapist's responsibility to bring within that session. And we'll talk more about that in, sec in a second when we look at connection and disconnection within um, the session. So let's connect the dots. So I've already started to connect some of those dots with regards to the therapeutic relationship in RCT. So we see that they, these two things belong together. We see that. And so these are some examples of um, disconnections that we might see within our clients. We might see this within session. So these defense mechanisms, so this denial, um, when you say something or recall something, or maybe you even bring something to the client's attention, and there's this denial, this defense mechanism, um, that could be a, a form of disconnection within that relationship. 
And yes, there are disconnections, but the goal is always to address the disconnection and rework it. So we can use these defense mechanisms, but then we talk about them, we process them to change them. So it also is CBT-ish um, as well. So then we have shutting down, defensiveness, deflection, even victimization sometimes. Like everybody's always beating up on me and you know, why do these things always happen to me? So sometimes these are, um, are defense mechanisms that our client has to hold on to within those relationships because those are safe. Um, there's distrust within the relationship. And I tell clients usually when I um, meet them for the first time that I know that it is difficult to open up. Um, especially when you've had so many people in your life that have shown you that you can't trust them. And so I even um, give the statement, I understand that you might come into the relationship and not trust me right off. But hopefully, at some point in the relationship, you can be more open and you can be more trusting of me. And they're usually really receptive to that. Um, also, a thing, uh, um, something that a client could do um, is having poor eye contact with you and having a closed body language to where they don't want you in their space. Um, frequent cancellations and no-shows to appointments, that's also a way to disconnect. Um, and sometimes we don't necessarily think about that, but when a client cancels and no-shows, there is something there, not necessarily saying it has to do with that therapeutic relationship, but something is happening. And um, once you've been maybe working with a client a couple sessions and then they start to cancel and they start to no show and come late, it disrupts that relationship within that alliance. And then we also have these cognitive distortions and negative self-talk. Um, so you can see those as a way of the client disconnecting based on some of their experiences and what they feel and think about themselves. Okay, so these are a couple ways in which um, a couple of examples that uh, a counselor disconnects with the client. So no discussion of culture. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is something I'm not going to say every counselor, but this is something um, that can be a struggle at times. And I think that's for anybody, no matter what race, gender, um, sexual orientation, any of that. I think sometimes culture is difficult to bring within that, um, the context of the relationship with the client within the session. Um, so we have an example, and I'll use race for example, just because that's um, pretty clear. So as a, a white therapist with a black client, um, we should explore that. Well, actually, I'm jumping ahead. So I'm jumping ahead to the next slide. So I'll stop myself right there. So there's no discussion of culture within that relationship. Um, and so the client might feel like they are not being acknowledged not following up with the client who no shows or has frequent cancellations. So the client is doing that and depending upon how busy you are or what, uh, what capacity you're working in, whether it's an agency or private practice, I don't have time to call that client to figure out where they are. And so um, with that therapist not reaching out to that client, they can feel that they are not cared about. Um, and then that therapist just goes to the next client. One thing um, that was, this was discussed in class, not necessarily the cell phone part, but taking notes during session. Uh, so at my um, institution, typically when we're in the training center, I've noticed that most people don't write or take notes during the session, but that's something I do. I do regularly. Um, it was almost kind of embedded or taught to me, like take some notes during the session to kind of figure out ex exactly what's going on. Um, and then I also take the notes because if a client is um, processing, I don't want to disrupt them within that. And so I just, sometimes I let them go. I let them talk and just express themselves and get every, every thought that they have out. And so I take notes um, just for my sake, if there's a point that I want to come back to. But that can also be uh, uh, seen as a, uh, a disconnection within the session. Um, the, client, you don't, the client doesn't necessarily know what you're writing down, 
it might make them feel nervous they might feel like they can't be authentic because you're writing something down i don't know who is you're going to provide that information to even though you said it was confidential maybe i'm telling you something really important and at that moment you're writing it down on a piece of paper um so that's a form and then also checking the cell phone during session sometimes we'll have our cell phones there you know um to check the time or whatnot but checking that is also a way to to show that the client maybe you're not paying attention even if it's two seconds it's just a way that says maybe what i'm saying right now isn't important a failure to address those cognitive distortions and negative self-talk so if a client is talking down on themselves and the therapist is not there to disrupt that and try to redirect that thought into something different then that client also could feel um less value within themselves and feel that that counselor is also seeing them in the way that they think they are. Another thing is doing the work for the client. Um, giving them the things that they need to do to be successful as opposed to working through it with the client. Having them to come up with solutions in a sense um, to some of the challenges they are experiencing. So yes, we are there to help the client, but it's really a collaborative relationship. And so if we do the work for the client, then the client doesn't necessarily know how to work for themselves or it kind of falls into that trap if, um, if there is a challenge with these disconnections and these relational images, these negative relational images, it might fall into that category. Okay, so now we have the application. So we talked about um, connection and disconnection. We gave some examples of how they might look in a relationship. We went over some basic foundational things of RCT, that therapeutic relationship. And now um, I want some audience participation. Now we're going to apply um, what we have just talked about. So we have this um, idea called within RCT called relational resilience. And that helps us to identify which areas are of disconnection within that relationship. And then we work to reconnect those things. So re with re relational resilience, so these are some ways in which we can um, transition that disconnection into a connection within that relationship. So we can acknowledge the culture and the power. And that's what I was jumping ahead in the previous um, two slides, is that we have to acknowledge the culture. We have to acknowledge that power differential that is seen within that session. So if I'm a white therapist and my client is black, it's important for me to recognize that and to explore that because guess what? There is a history around that dynamic and around trust. And so, that is a discussion that we have to have within that session and how that dynamic could potentially be affected. And while it is fearful for a lot of people to bring things as far as is race, as sexual orientation, religious within those sessions, it is necessary. And people really do appreciate that. Clients do appreciate that when you acknowledge, um, acknowledge that. When, um, so we can address the disconnection. So if we are in a session with the client and we feel that client is holding back or we can visibly see that um, they are shutting down within that session, we can acknowledge that something has made them uncomfortable and we can see that they're shutting down and we can try to work through that with that client so that we can become reconnected collaboratively working on treatment plans and goals and so instead of okay so based on the assessment these are the this is the plan that we're going to have for you based on the goals that you said that you wanted instead we could take the approach of okay so these are the treatment plan this is the treatment plan that i came up with and here are the interventions based on um uh, what i think would be best I would like your feedback on some of these things that I said. And if that client 
feels like, no, I don't think that's something that I could do at this point, then let's work together to try to change that plan or that goal into something that is more feasible for you to do. Um, appointment times. I'm trying to remember exactly what I meant by appointment times. Probably come back to that and we'll look at. Oh, okay. I remember. So appointment time. So um, one thing that um, I do in private practice is with appointment times, I have times blocked out to when I know that I'm in the office and I typically try to keep my clients really close together. Um, and so sometimes within that, I could tell the client, okay, so let's make your next appointment. Oops. So let's make your next appointment. So I have a two o'clock available with that work for you. So we can change that language by saying, okay, so I'm here on Tuesday and I have availability from 12 to five. What time would you like to come in? Because that gives that client a little more power and control within that relationship because sometimes the client counsel relationship can be a little intimidating and the client might not necessarily feel that they have power within that relationship. So giving them just a little bit to say, here's, here is a time frame as opposed to a specific time and here's a day in which I'm available. What time do you want to come in? That would be great. One thing um, that I've just most uh, recently started doing is uh, around the frequency of appointments. So when I initially started off um, in counseling and seeing clients, so I've always been in private practice. So when I was going through the supervision process, I was also in private practice. And it was kind of one of those things to where everybody was seen twice a, or everybody was seen once a week. And I started questioning that everybody is not at the same level and everybody doesn't need the same level of care. But even though a client comes into the counseling session, they make the appointment, they call, they're there, that doesn't necessarily mean they're 100% ready um, for what could occur. And so what I started doing is a way that I give some of that power and control back to the client is, I ask them how often do they feel like they can come into counseling. Some clients, because it's a lot of work and it opens up, sometimes those sessions open up a lot of wounds. Um, and so giving the power back to the client to say, okay, so what do you feel like you can commit to? And not even providing my feedback or my thoughts initially, but kind of hearing where they are and what they want to do. And then I can give my perspective um, on what I think. And then guess what? Always giving them the flexibility. If something comes up and you feel like, you know what, this is difficult and I need to come to, um, once every week, then we can do that. And I also provide them that option to, um, to do that as well. Um, another thing is allowing the client to sit in the therapist seat. So it, I had an interesting experience with this. So um, my client room, and I know a lot of people's sessions are kind of set up like this. You have a couch on one side, and then you have um, the seat that the therapist would typically sit in on the other side. And it's just a single kind of seat, love, not a love seat, but a chair. And so uh, I had an experience where a client actually sat in the therapist seat. And so I sat on the couch um, and I didn't say anything. It's just like wherever you want to sit. And I was thinking like how awesome that would be within session to allow a client to sit wherever they want to, whether it's my chair or it's the couch, um, to kind of um, allow them some power within that relationship, but then also just knowing that, you know what, it's not important where we sit because guess what? We're going to work together to get through this. Uh, permission to take notes. So like I said, within session, um, and I was a note taker within session. And what I do now is I usually put my note, I don't have it on my lap, so it's on the side and I just write as needed. But then asking permission, is it okay for me to take a couple notes? 
um, because you're saying, I, I don't want to interrupt you while you're expressing yourself or while you're sharing with me. So I'm just going to take a couple notes on some things that I want to revisit. Um, and then self-disclosure. So self-disclosure is one of those things. It's either you like it or you don't, or um, kind of a gray area at times too, whether I should do it or whether I should not do it. But self-disclosure is also a powerful tool. And of course you wanna be careful of what you self-disclose and what's your rationale behind that. But sometimes that can bridge that gap and allow the client to draw in closer to you. So this is where um, some participation is involved. So uh, what other ways can you think of where you can transition a disconnection that you've identified within a client session or a potential disconnection if you don't um, currently see clients? What is a way in which you could bridge that gap, bridge uh, disconnection to connection to build relational resilience? So you can unmute your lines, um, or I believe there's a chat option. You can put those kind of thoughts in too. I can talk for a little bit. Um, so I was just kind of thinking how you were talking about um, like asking permission to take notes. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever had a client who prefers to like doodle or draw while they're talking because it helps them express themselves? Like, is that something that you could use in a session to help um, bridge that gap between disconnection and connection? Yes, definitely so. Um, Definitely. So I think that would be a, a, an option because um, even, and I've, I've had clients to where they kind of seem a little fidgety. Um, and so even within those, those sessions, I ask them, Hey, do you want to, you want some Play-Doh or you want a squishy ball or something like that? Yes, I can take that. And so just even noticing little things like that about the client would also be beneficial. So yeah, I would definitely say that if they feel comfortable with doodling or even coloring, I've had clients to color in session while we talk um, to help them because I think also too, it's a way um, for them to open up and to, to be more comfortable with that because guess what? Maybe they're focusing a little more attention on what they're coloring um, and it helps to relieve some of that anxiety that comes along with that process too. So I would say yes, definitely. And there's a comment in the uh, chat, the exploration of silence within the session, discussing silence together and understanding if it is related to disconnection or processing. Yeah, so is the question around sh um, addressing that? Oh, no, that was, a, that was an example. Yes, yeah. and you know what, that I actually did not think about that one. And I think that is definitely um, noteworthy to do because guess what? We all have those sessions where there's quiet, there's awkward. And so maybe the therapist feels compelled to say something. Um, but even going into that, I, I think a lot of this is helpful uh, before it occurs. And to note that there probably will be some silence and you will be thinking and you will be processing, but guess what? There might be silence because you don't want to share what you want to share. And so silence either way is okay. And you can be free and be open to share as you see fit. Um, so even prefacing those types of things to the client um, also kind of gives them some of that control within that relationship, but then also, um, 
drawing that counselor in as well so that they can form a connection. So yeah, that was a really good example. So we are gonna move on to our last slide and hopefully we get some participation here too. So this is um, testing your knowledge. So there's a couple questions that I have here. Um, in what ways do you connect with your client during initial stages of counseling and then advanced stages of counseling? And my thought around this question was sometimes that relationship looks different when you are first starting to interact with the client and doing the intake process and kind of getting all the information and to develop the treatment plan, identify the goals, how can, um, in what ways do you connect initially with the client and then how does that look in advanced stages? One thing in which I do during initial stages, uh, like I said, is that I let the client know that I understand they might not necessarily trust me right off. Um, and I try to create a space that is pretty free, pretty open, not non-judgmental. I also let them know if I'm taking an approach that is not a comfortable approach or it's an approach that you don't agree with to let me know and we can redirect, we'll process and we'll redirect. Uh, so I do that initially um, in those initial stages of counseling. During the advanced stages, uh, when they come into the room and it's a weekend, so what did you do this weekend? So how how were things for you? Oh, you I remember you told me last week that you had da 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 da, and so tell me about that. How did that go? So it's more still just caring and concern for that client and their well being and showing that yes, whatever is happening in your life is important to me. Um, whether it's something that's noteworthy or not, whether it's something that's positive or something that's negative, I want you to share those things because that's a part of you. Um, and those, if, if those are things that you want to work on or you want to work through or you talk through, then we can definitely do that. That's just how I um, do things within those sessions. What about the second question? What can you do um, to determine when you are dis? What can you determine? Probably wrote that wrong. So how can you determine when you are disconnected with your client? What does that feel like? I kind of assume I don't work with clients yet. Um, I'm in my second year of master's program. Um, but I imagine it feels like you might not look forward to seeing that client or um, like you see their name on the schedule and you're like, oh, I get to deal with so-and-so today. Like just kind of like a little negative. Um, so it might be good to catch yourself when you're having those moments and try to find ways that like take negative and put it into a positive. Exactly. And then even exploring why I feel that way what is happening because there could be something that was triggering for you within that session and you just don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to, um, I like that. So trying to, to focus on what is happening within that session, but yeah, definitely. If you dread seeing this client and, or even like after the session, taking it on and thinking about, I have to see this client Friday and it's only Monday what am I going to do? What am I going to say to them? I hope they cancel and different things like that. So yeah, so probably a little anxious, a little draining, um, lack of motivation probably too, to not want to do it, not do the work. So yeah, good example. Thank you for sharing.
Any other thoughts of how that would uh, look or feel, or how can you make that determination? I had a, a client who I could not remember this client's name from session to session. I couldn't remember uh, what we talked about in the previous session. It was weird because I'm like, I see a nice amount of clients, but I can remember details about each of the client, but I cannot remember this client's name. I can't remember what we talked about. And so that was a form of disconnection to me is just not remembering and not recalling and almost not feeling invested in this client like I was invested in some of my other clients. And let's go on to our last one. Um, so when disconnected, how can you operationalize? For five minutes. Yes. So that's where we talked about when I am um, disconnected with the client, how do I come back into alignment or how can I um, reconnect with that? I almost feel like you need to find common ground again um, to find a way to reevaluate where you are in your counseling relationship and then how to take it to the next step. It's almost like sometimes people get to a plateau with their clients mm -hmm. and they don't know how to move forward or past that plateau. Um, so just finding a common ground or a common interest that might be able to spark more conversations and re-establish that connection. Exactly. I think that's a great example. Mm -hmm. And I even think also too, sometimes when we feel that, we don't necessarily address it. It's something that we kind of struggle with ourselves and may, may not even bring it up to the client. But I think you know, a great gestalt way <laughs> of doing that is addressing the feeling within that session. Because sometimes you can actually feel that within that session as well. And so let's kind of address and kind of figure out where we are, where we want to go. And um, like you said, reestablish some type of common ground uh, to get to that place. So yeah, great example. So I know we only have about five minutes left, so I do want to open it up to any questions that anyone may have or comments. I just want to say thank you for presenting today. You did a wonderful job. You're very welcome. I'm the sleep deprived doctoral student, which is Typical. <laughs> I believe it. So it does not look like there are any questions. So I appreciate um, each person for um, attending this workshop and hopefully there was something within, um, within the presentation that resonated with you and that you can also apply to, to build that connection with your client. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks, you too.